Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here um, and to get to talk to you. I'm going to talk about creating an open knowledge society. Uh, I'm just going to start at the very beginning uh, and give you a tiny bit of information about, about myself and the organization. Uh, open knowledge, we're a nonprofit, we're a global network. Uh, we've been working since 2004 to open up information around the world, and in particular to also to see that used and useful to empower citizens, to empower organizations, to empower researchers, to empower entrepreneurs, to answer questions that matter and drive positive change. And we do two particular activities. First of all, we open up information, we bug governments, we support governments, uh, we talk to corporations, we talk to researchers and other kinds of uh, and NGOs to open up essential content and data. Uh, starting all, uh, all around the world. And we also then turn, if you like, work on turning data into knowledge uh, and, and change. And that's uh, obviously a huge thing, one where we only have kind of selective and we work a lot with other organizations, including, in fact, Wikipedia, Wikimania, uh, but many, many others, um, from several society organizations to governments. Um, and, you know, the, some of the projects from CCAN to open spending to School of Data, giving people skills, one of the things we focus on today is as all data is starting to be available, substantial amounts of open data, but are there the skills in civil society, uh, in government, in the media, and others to take advantage of this? So I'm going to start with a story about medicine, about healthcare. Um, and it starts, actually, it starts in 2004 in Shasta County in Northern California. And uh, a Catholic priest, in fact, a relatively new Catholic priest, uh, he'd previously been an accountant in Las Vegas, so this was quite a career change. He was now a Catholic priest. Um, and sad to say, actually, but this bad later story of this is he actually got defrocked for sexting um, when I researched this more recently, but that's a, that's a different part of the story. But at this point, he was a Catholic priest named John Carapi. And he experienced some chest planes. And Shasta County is relatively rural. He actually like, did a lot of fishing up here and then traveled around. He was, quite, he, was, he was quite a successful Catholic priest. He, was, you know, he went out on the road giving big talks and stuff. But he got chest pain. And he was in his 50s. And obviously, you, know, you might worry about heart, uh, you know, heart disease, heart stuff. So he went to his primary care physician who recommended, who referred him to what was at the time called the Reading Medical Center, run by a for-profit healthcare chain called Tenet uh, Healthcare. And he had a cardiogram done, an angiogram, an angiogram, and this is, oh my God, they can't, you know, he got called up four hours later after he left the hospital, you know, you have to come in for a double heart bypass right now, you're at serious risk, it's a real issue, right now, we're going to book you in two days from now for a, for a heart bypass. Now this is obviously quite a shocking and uh, stressful piece of news. Um, he went home, I mean he was at home, but he called up his friend, who was still, by the way, this was his, one of his best friends, was still an accountant in Las Vegas. Um, and his friend um, said to him, well, my partner is actually a senior, a senior nurse at the local hospital. Why don't you just let me give her a call and just check about this, get a second opinion? So he called up his partner, and she told him, uh, you know, the phone got relayed, was that basically it was really unlikely it was this urgent. You know, it wasn't like, you know, it's not, it's not like, you know, you've got a kind of aneurysm or something. You have time. If you've got an issue with your heart, you've got a week or two. It's not like, you know, it's not like you have to have it done tomorrow. Why don't you come down to Las Vegas to my hospital and I get a second opinion? So he set off. He came down to, uh, to, went down to Las Vegas, flew down, had a second opinion you're fine. There's nothing wrong with your heart. You're absolutely fine. In good condition for your age. So obviously he was now a bit shocked. You know, was he at death's door or was he actually absolutely fine and this was just a bit of heartburn after lunch? So they got a third opinion. Third opinion, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. So they went... Um, they kind of got a bit upset about this. I mean, he'd been very stressed. It's a very stressful experience thinking that you're seriously ill. It's a really, uh, if you're not aware, I mean, I wasn't aware before I read about this, but it's you know, very serious, obviously, operation, having a heart bypass. They cut you open. They, they split your rib cage, essentially, um, if they do this. It's a really serious operation. So they went in to see the CEO of this hospital. Uh, this, this is a private hospital, right? It has a CEO in the United States. And they said, this is an issue. This is a real concern. What's going on? And the guy was like, don't worry. Mistakes happen. People can misread angiograms. It does happen. 
you know, and they asked other doctors, and it's true, you know, it's not, it's not a perfect science. But they persisted a bit on this, and they kind of got upset, and they kind of started asking around. And there was a bit of a rumor mill in this area, of, uh, in, in, in this town in California, you know, that they were, they were a bit trigger happy on the heart bypasses. Um, in fact, it was said among some of the, it was a joke among some of the, the, you know, GPs in the area that you mustn't get a flat tire in front of Reading Medical Center because you'll end up with a heart bypass. Um, if you go in there, you'll come out with a heart bypass. And they kind of got suspicious and they started talking. And in fact, ultimately, they, they got in touch with someone from the FBI. And the reason for this is the FBI are interested in the United States. This hospital will charge the government money. It's a private hospital, but it does Medicaid and Medicare. And if someone is defrauding the government, the government can get involved. The FBI can get involved. Anyway, for various reasons, an investigation started. And it turned out that more than 1,000 people over a period of about a decade had been incorrectly diagnosed with heart problems and given serious treatment, often involving a heart bypass or a serious operation. Some of the people had died after complications. Some of the people had been left um, with serious health problems for life. Some people, for example, their chest. One guy, his chest had never knitted back together properly. His ribs had never reformed, and they constantly moved in his chest, causing serious pain. So more than a 1,000 people had been mistreated. And the reason for this, sad to say, was, was felt to be profit. Performing heart bypasses on healthy people is very profitable in the United States. You make hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in, medical, in medical health insurance payments when you perform a heart bypass on someone. This was the most profitable hospital in the tenant healthcare chain in the United States for this reason. The doctors who performed, who were, who were in the cardiography department, were, million, were making million-dollar salaries. They never, sadly, while they had a civil suit, they never went to jail. Now, what was interesting, why has all of this got to do with data? This hospital had two, there is actually a data set in the United States. Um, it's not an open one at present, but it was, there was one starting to be collected in the 90s. It was only in the 90s which had information on the performance of hospitals. And this hospital had two red flags if you'd looked at the database. One is that it had an incredible number of heart operations for the number of people it served. It was doing a lot of these kind of operations for the number of people in the catchment area. The second was that it had incredible performance. It had a really good mortality rate for high operations. Because operating on healthy people is really good for your statistics. Now, taken together, that's really odd, though. If you operate on a lot of people, in general, you should either be reverting to the mean, or if you're, in fact, taking at-risk people, often it's the case that people that operate a lot. For example, UCL, uh, U University College Hospital in London, is one of the best hospitals in the UK. And yet, often, its mortality performance for certain operations is very poor because it takes the hardest cases. So often, if you, were doing a, if you were an incredible hospital heart bypass, you'd end up with some of the hardest cases, and you'd actually have a poor mortality record. So together, these two things should have been a red flag. I think this brings me to a point about data and the power of data, which is, and about open data. If someone had been looking, if someone had had these suspicions locally and been able to look at this kind of data set and put those kind of things together, it would have been able to them to transform what was simply a suspicion a general suspicion into an actual kind of hard hunch that something was wrong. And this point, which is if you know your open, free and open source software, you'll know the first, the first of these citations is famous as, to many eyes, all bugs are shallow. To many eyes, all anomalies are obvious. We have this immense amount of data, but we need people to look at it. And the fact was, often, people, even if the data is available inside government, not the right people are looking at it. To give one other example, if Mike is still here in the audience, I don't know if he is, he'll love, is I was told the other day um, by the, 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 the CTO of the UK government that he'd been able to solve, save £6 million in 15 minutes. Which I think is doing even better than Mike is doing, which is pretty impressive. By being able to look at government spending money, UK now publishes open data on spending, and by able, being able just to look through what departments were spending, he realized that the departments were all buying the same £50,000 report, but there are £50,000 reports, believe it or not, or something like that, that they were buying 15 copies of it. Each department was buying its own. And just being able to see that. Now, government could have looked at that before, but it was only when that data became open data and when the government's CTO didn't have to start a digital project but could just go online, search for two seconds and find something, that you made that saving. 
And this point again, the best thing to do with your data will be thought of by someone else. If that data had just sat in the treasury, would the government CTO have been able to make the saving? Probably not. It needed someone else, somewhere else, to do that. And there's so many of these questions in our everyday lives. Is it safe to cycle? I don't know if you know last autumn there was a whole scare in the UK that there was a whole bunch of cycling deaths. Was cycling getting more dangerous? Was it the weather? Or was it just statistical chance? Where does our money go when we pay taxes? What happens to it? What does it get spent on? Where? And climate change. You know, from the smallest things of the everyday on my, my, my journey, my commute to work on my bicycle, to big things like climate change, data is essential to be able to address these problems. Now, I'm going to come to the problem, I think, that we um, generally, I think, as a community, the open community, but especially open knowledge, are looking to address, which is there are a lot of parts of getting data from of using information to drive change in the world. And most fundamentally, I'm not learning on this list, is that someone ultimately has to use it. But we, I think, in general, have to focus on particular challenges. We can't, we can't boil the ocean. We have to pick our fights. And for us, I think, to start with is to say, looking at many of these examples, the data is locked up. The data is not available. It's not available to me or you. Um, it was in most, many countries of the world, you sometimes struggle to even get the budget, let alone get it in a form that allows you to look at it, let alone get all of the spending data like you get in the UK. On climate change, up-to-date data on climate change and CO2 is still often kept. You have to pay, by the way, tens of thousands of pounds to the OECD to get one of their key data sets on climate change. So data is locked up and data is hard to get and use. Now, in some sense, we've seen incredible progress over the last decade since we were founded, and particularly in the last five years on the first of these, data being locked up. So I'm not going to go on about it today, actually. I'm going to focus on data is hard to get and use. I'm going to get really specific, because I think this is a very informed audience. I don't want to go on too much about open in general. I'm going to talk about something I call frictionless data. I think part of my point here is that data generally, and in a way we could forget open data for a moment, is too hard to get and use particularly in a distributed community, particularly a community that isn't one corporation, that isn't Google, that isn't the NSA. The NSA is probably the biggest data processor in the world. Uh, but if we're a distributed community, if we're a collaborative community, if we're a community that, a community that goes across individuals, that goes across organizations, there's too much friction. And I'm going to push an analogy very hard with you today. And I hope you'll bear with me. It's a shipping analogy. And I like to think of it as logistics. Who here, who here, I'm going to do a bit of interaction. Who here has gone and bought some food in the last week? Maybe if I really wanted to, I mean, hardcore geeks here, maybe I should ask, who hasn't gone and bought food in the last week? You know, no one shamefully puts their hand up. No one has gone, I mean, you know, actually gone out to a store and bought it. Not, I don't mean consumed it, but gone out. Okay, but do you ever think, I mean, occasionally it hits you, you know, you go into a store today and you just think how amazing it would be for a medieval peasant. Just the incredible choice. You, you go into a supermarket today and the incredible choice and you stand there just in the fruit section and you think how far some of this stuff has come. I mean, I'm not trying to weigh whether that's good or bad, I'm just saying it's incredible, the choice in front of us. And the miracle of logistics that goes into that Stuff has been shipped sometimes halfway around the world, or it's even been just shipped from Scotland or from just outside London. But it's, it's been picked by someone, it's been packed up, it's been put in logistics lorries. And you know one of the things about medieval times that was incredible to me when I read about it, was reading about it recently, is when famines happened, it often wasn't that there wasn't enough, for example, corn grown in the UK. You could actually have localized famines. You could have an issue where there was enough corn in Manchester, but not enough in London, because the cost of transporting corn was so much from place to place. And so the incredible thing for me, I think, about, about transport is how essential it is in our daily lives. When I go to get those ingredients to make a cake, all of the stuff that's gone from the corn being cut in the field to it being transported to me. Now, I'm, the reason I'm having this analogy is it's about data and information. Ultimately, we want to make a cake or we want to eat dinner. We want to produce a beautiful graph or create some new insight or understand whether hospitals are killing people semi-intentionally for money. And that involves getting information together. It's like I go to the information store. I want to get all of that stuff together, the, the, you know, if you like, and I want to bake my cake. The cake is the end analysis that I make, the insight I have, the visualization I make. And at the moment, and I'm going to push the shipping analogy, uh, specifically about shipping, we're almost in an age where I have to go out into the fields and almost get the core myself. Maybe I don't need to grow it, but maybe I need to cut it. 
I need to mill it myself to make flour. And then I need to cart the flour back. And I need to have some, go and get the, the eggs from the hens. A lot of the time when you do data projects, you're doing all of that. You're not just focusing at the end part of it. So I'm going to really push this shipping analogy for a particular specific point I'm going to make about a particular revolution in shipping. So back in 1955, shipping in particular looked like this. And there was a particular part of this, which was that loading ships. Loading ships was a big deal, right? It was, in fact, I'll come to it, it's a large part of the cost. And this is what it looked like. People, by hand, would load ships. And it was manual, it was slow, and it was costly. And it was also dangerous. I don't know who here has seen On the Waterfront. Anyone? Yeah, some of you have seen On the Waterfront with Marlon Brando. And On the Waterfront is about, well, I guess the politics of Steve Doring in the United States, right? These people, this is a whole union, it was a very powerful union that loaded ships. They were called longshoremen or Steve Doors. And if, if you remember in On the Waterfront, if you've seen it, one of the guys who's protesting against the evil union gets crushed in a ship by people dropping stuff on him. It was a dangerous profession, and it was incredibly inefficient. And in 1957, the first containerized ship was built. And it has revolutionized shipping. There aren't, I mean, whether you think it's good or bad, today, there are, no, there are very few people around. Very few people get injured loading ships. It is automated, it is mechanized. And this is one part of the journey, right? This is one part of the stuff that gets, stuff, that gets food, that gets your laptops, that gets your phone from wherever they get made to you when you go in the store. And containerization has revolutionized that. And data is shipping pre-containerization. That's my argument. Today, we load, we do all of this kind of loading by hand. I just want to give you an idea of how revolutionary this is in terms of cost in shipping. Just to, when I say how revolutionary, this is what it used to cost to do shipping. Okay? So, in 1956, this was the first containerized ship, and you can see it compared to what was called a brake bolt, traditional loaded ship. Okay? It's the second line. The loading cost per ton was $5.86 versus 16 cents for containerized shipping. That's approximately a 50 times improvement in cost. Look at the tons per man hour, right? The year, 90, this is over time, but 1956, this is an average. By 1956, 76, most stuff was containerized around the US. In 1959, you did 6.6 .6 tons of loading by hand per man, per man hour. In 1956, you did 4,234, which is close to being a 6,500 improvement in performance. And hours in port went from 504 to 18. And just to give you a sense of the statistic, in terms of shipping goods around, it used to be that the five miles either side of port, which included the off offloading, accounted for over 90% of shipping stuff around, even in 1955. It was the off unloading and offloading with by hand that consumed 90% of the cost of this stuff. And that's what happens. For those of you who, know, who do stuff with data today, that's what it's often like. Before you get your beautiful visualization, you've spent days, if not weeks, collecting data together, cleaning it up, working out what's wrong with it, fixing it up, getting it from one machine to another. And I want to make an argument then for something very specific. And I'm going to say, why was containerization so good? And I'm going to argue there were three things that were great about containerization. Right? Just to be clear about containerization, it was just about putting containers on things. It didn't change the stuff inside. It didn't do anything else. It just put a, a standardized box around the stuff you were shipping. It was simple. A steel box is very simple. It was opaque. You could ship iPhones, you could be shipping bananas. You could be shipping cars. It's all the same to the container, roughly. It all goes inside a container somewhere, and then it gets loaded on the ship. And the third thing I would call, which is a bit odd, is moderated diversity. Okay? Which is that not all containers are the same size, in fact. They may look like it, but there are different versions of containers, and I'll come to this. There is allowance for diversity but it's under control. It's not any kind of container, but there's moderated diversity. And so I'm going to introduce the analogy for data here. This is the, the, the point I'm making called data package. And you can find out more at data.okfn.org, Open Knowledge Foundation website. So the data package, I'm arguing, is the analogy for the sh shipping container for data. 
So I'm not going to go, this is, this, is a, this is a keynote talk, so I'm not going to get into the dirty details of the tech, tech of it. But what I'm saying is it's an incredibly simple wrapper around your data. It's like, a, it's like a shipping container. It's pretty bare and simple, and it says there's this data package.json, and you can put data inside this thing. The second thing about it that I'm going to come to, which I'm, uh, that we could talk more about, but it's, it's any kind of data. Data packages ship any kind of data, just like, just like containers can. They're opaque to what goes in them. They can ship geospatial data, they can ship tabular data, they can ship wicked images, they could ship video, they could ship whatever you like. They focus more on structured data. And the third thing is what I call moderated diversity. So just to go on about this one, for those of you who are your shipping geeks, I don't know if there are any of you here, but I, 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 only, I, had, to, I had to get up to speed for this talk. That's a, the, the container on the left is a real Rolls Royce. It's a very specialized container. It's a pallet wide, exactly one standardized pallet wide. By the way, I didn't know this before, but pallets, if you know what I mean by a pallet, a wooden pallet, they're standardized. There's an ISO standard for pallets about their size. And this is exactly one pallet wide. 45 foot long, high cube shipping container. So it's a shipping container, but one that's slightly specialized. And that's the same with data packages. There are data packages just for tabular data that say, you've just got to ship this kind of thing. It can't be, it's like a pallet. It can't be bananas. It has to be exactly this thing. It has to be CSV data, in fact. It has to be tabular data. It has to be a CSV and so on. So this is moderated diversity. And so I kind of want to say on this, which is say, this is not... I'm coming in some sense with some humility here. I'm not trying to pitch you some incredible vision, but I think that it's like the shipping container, that it seems rather humble and simple, but it has revolutionized our ability to do logistics. And right now, part of our issue is around data logistics, our ability to efficiently get data from A to B, and to cut out some of the huge amount of effort that is going on at the moment, shipping data around between different places. One could see this in some sense with Wikidata, right? Most of the data going into Wikidata already exists somewhere, in some other system. Yet I get the impression, and rightly, that quite significant amounts of effort are making, being made to transport it across and integrate it in. That effort has to go down if our community is to flourish. If we are being able to ship data around and therefore build a distributed, collaborative community that we want to build. So I'm going to conclude. And I want to kind of loop back from this very specific example to the big picture, which is that we're becoming this knowledge society. And in this knowledge society, there's always that commonplace that knowledge is power. But that is even more true today and will become more true during the century. And it's not clear, to be honest, what way it goes. Many of us, I think, have a slight inclination to the techno-utopianism, that technology will generally improve things, and digital technology even more so. It's been incredible what it's allowed us to do. But it's not inevitable. There, will be, there is immense power and wealth to be held by controlling information. And we're going to have to have a choice, and in fact, I would imagine some degree of significant fights about open versus closed. And I think this vision that we have of the open knowledge society is one that we want to see built around open rather than closed, around collaboration rather than control, and around sharing rather than exploitation. And fundamentally about empowering versus exploiting people. And that is something where we have to think hard, and it's something where we have to architect systems that allow us. So to go back to why I've gone on today about the shipping container, it's fundamental, I think, at this point, we're starting to win, I think there's so far to go, but we're starting to win in terms of open data. But one of the challenges we have today is we have very little infrastructure. A lot of our infrastructure at the moment seems to be pushing for largeness and centralization. Does anyone remember the net, like, 14 years ago, when I, I mean, 20 in the 90s? I think the number of websites, I go to fewer websites today than I used to, by a long way. The web has become centralized at the present in significant ways. Even Wikipedia is an extraordinary example. It is amazing. But when I first went to the web, I would go to many different websites to find something out. Now I maybe just go to one. And that is a dangerous tendency, and it's a point where things like shipping containers actually matter, because the infrastructure determines how we can collaborate. And our power 
is in our distributed, is in our community, is in the wealth and breadth of it. But we need the infrastructures that allow us to effectively collaborate at scale. And things such as shipping are part of that. That efficiency is fundamental to how we can set up an open information and open knowledge ecosystem. So we want to make sure that we become an open knowledge society and not a closed one. And I want to leave you with that, that we empower ourselves to answer the questions, to go to the curiosity in us, to ensure that that ability to satisfy our curiosity to, to pursue it remains. Thank you very much.